We're going to start off today's History Bite with a story. Picture this. It's the 1600s. You live in a small Spanish colonial town in South America. And suddenly you hear there's been a fight. A terrible brawl in the streets and you rush over only to find one person dead and another one lying wounded. But you recognize this man. This man is a legend. He's fierce. Rumor has it that he cut swaths of blood through Native American land during his time as a soldier. This dying man asks you to fetch the priest so that last rites can be administered. And so you do, and the priest comes, and while this man is confessing his final sins, it turns out that this man is actually a woman. And that is part of the story of Catalina de Arauzo. And her story is very interesting because it gives us incredible insights into Spanish colonial society. And that's what we're going to look at on this history bite. Now, the story of Catalina de Arauzo is fascinating just on the surface of it. Born in 1585 in the Basque country of Spain, Arauzo was taken to a nunnery at the young age of four. However, by the age of 15, she decided to run away from the nunnery, seeing no future there. After the escape, she ventured around the Basque country, working odd jobs and becoming handy with a sword. It was at this point she cut her hair and took on the identity of a boy. After three years, she signed up on a ship headed for the Americas. In the process, robbing and killing her uncle, a foretaste of things to come. She worked a variety of locations and jobs all over South America, including working as an overseer in the infamous silver mines of Potosi, all the while operating under the name Francisco. In 1617, she signed up to fight the Native Americans who were rebelling against the Spanish in what is now Chile. In an even more interesting twist, the person she signed up under the command of was her own brother, who she would later go on to accidentally kill in a duel. And speaking of killing, Erauso developed quite the reputation, not only as a fierce warrior and a brave soldier, but a vicious one as well. She was denied a promotion because she killed too many Native Americans, both inside and outside of battle. After her time in the service, she spent several years moving around South America, doing odd jobs for local administrators, getting into fights with other people and arguments where she often killed people which then forced her to go to other parts of South America and repeat the process. Finally, in 1623, after being arrested in Peru, she was set to be hanged for yet another murder, but confessed her identity. She was quickly released, and she went on to petition the Spanish crown for compensation she had never received for her time as a soldier. She even sailed back to Europe to meet with the Pope to help make her case. And in the end, she was granted her request and settled on a plot of land north of Mexico City, where she lived out the rest of her life, moving goods back and forth between the city and the coast. And part of what makes this story so fascinating is she did all this as a woman, at a time when most women did not leave the villages or towns they were born in. Yes, it's, it's true, a little bit of deception was involved. But Arauso, no doubt, went to great lengths to hide her identity, even from her own siblings. Beyond just cutting her hair short, she even promised to marry several women. However, in the end, she only ran away with the dowry payment. Arauso literally changed her gender and lived the life of a man. To really appreciate the story of Arauso, we have to consider the complex legal and racial and gendered hierarchy that existed in Spanish colonial society at the time. Contemporary historians refer to the legal, racial, gender, social hierarchy of the Spanish colonies by a term casta, or the casta system though it was not ever called such a name back then. The word casta is a Spanish word for purity, and it has its roots in the Reconquista, where the Spanish Christians sought to separate themselves from the Jews and the Muslims they had conquered. And so the notion of blood purity, and how one's blood determined their abilities in society, was born. And if this at all sounds like contemporary notions of racism, then you are indeed paying attention. In Spanish Latin American society, the top positions were reserved for those born in Spain, or Europe, known as peninsulares, because they came from the Iberian Peninsula. Those with European parents who were born in the Americas are known as criollos. It was said that something about the climate simply ruined their pure European blood. So maybe it wasn't all about race and gender after all. Below this group were the mestizos, or the mixed blood people, who had parents of both European and Native American heritage. And below them were the pure Native Americans. There was also, of course, an African element, as Europeans had imported large numbers of African slaves to work with their profitable ventures. This whole system has been immortalized by the famous Casta painting. These paintings attempted to demonstrate all the possible combinations and names for these combinations, like a weird pear matrix. Now, these paintings were made for the rich to hang in their living room. A better explanation of this complex legal system can be seen in this chart. Created by archaeologist Gerardo Gutierrez, 
It uses a triangle shape to demonstrate the known positions and titles of the casta system. But the reason for the existence of this system itself comes from the nature of Spanish colonization. Spanish colonies were about extracting wealth via precious metals or profitable enterprises such as ranching. So the majority of immigrants to the Spanish colonies were young men, soldiers, entrepreneurs. These men wanted to get rich and maybe even go back to Spain. Women did not come over in large numbers until much later. As a consequence, according to women's studies scholar Teresa Yugar, the colonial enterprise from the beginning brought with it an outlook of conquest, not only of the land, but also of women as well. In the name of the Spanish crown, Spanish men felt entitled to conquer the indigenous population, their land, and their women. Now, of course, there are examples of consensual marriages between enterprising Europeans to gain an advantage with a local Native American group, but as often as not, this conquest of the indigenous female body um, was not always consensual. And hence the racial and blood purity side of the caste system had a gendered side as well, because women would be the vectors to determine purity. Women's movements in the colonies were strictly controlled and regulated, and signs of independence were often viewed as defiance of secular or religious authority. For example, of all the executions carried out by the church during the colonial era, 75% of the executed were women. And this is why an examination of Arauzo's story, her hiding her gender, her running away, her serving as a soldier, and finally getting compensation for all of her work, is so fascinating when considering the social hierarchy that existed during this time. And it raises questions about the rigidity of social structures and social hierarchy. However, this brings me to a second interesting character I'd like to introduce, Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz. Born and raised outside of Mexico City in 1651, Inés from a young age demonstrated a love of learning and knowledge. At the age of seven, she could read three languages and would later learn another, including the native Aztec language of Nahuatl. She later pestered her mother to send her to the university at the age of seven. Inés is most well known for her poetry, writing about the life of colonial Mexico. Her love of knowledge prompted her to become a nun at the age of 19, a choice that allowed her to continue to write, as Inez said, to have no fixed occupation which might curtail my freedom to study. Taking the role of a nun, she would never have to contend with the possibility of marriage. During her time as a nun, she became fluent in philosophy and theology, teaching herself via her reading. Her cell in her nunnery became sort of a salon, hosting intellectuals and local leaders who came to discuss ideas and ask her for insights on the issues of the day. Plays, poems, and religious works all flowed from her pen. Inez was acutely aware of the double standard that women were subjected to under the casta system. One of her most well-known poems, Foolish Men, addresses this very issue. You always are so foolish. Your censure is unfair. One you blame for cruelty, the other for being easy. And it is worth noting that the community that Inez was born into was funded and created by the church to cut down on the wild and crazy behavior of the Spanish male colonists. Yet Inez's attitude got her in trouble with the religious authorities, who forced her to give up her library of books she had spent years accumulating in 1694. Shortly afterwards, she died from the plague while tending to other nuns within their convent. So what do the tales of both of these women tell us about hierarchies and social positions and how we can navigate through them? For one, thinking about Arauzo's experience, one might ask if she was able to survive the challenging and established system because of her service to the crown. Not only did she become a soldier, but one of the most decorated in her company, both for bravery in battle and violence outside of combat the very same violence that had contributed to the establishment of this system that restricted her freedom. Yet she claimed benefits under that system and was rewarded for her behavior. Can you change your place in society by playing a different role in the social structure with more gusto and bravado than those that occupy that role already? Or does Inez provide a better example? She went into the nunnery because she knew that if she stayed outside the nunnery, the social norms of her society may have propelled her into marriage and the loss of opportunities to learn and be free to explore her intellectual curiosity. Being a nun, which was a socially acceptable position for a woman like herself, did provide an outlet that was normally beyond the acceptance of women's activity. While religious authorities are often held up as maintainers of social roles, religion, as often as not, provided an avenue for an alternative to the existing social order, the convent being a good example. Of course, both of these women's stories had extenuating circumstances. One was a decorated soldier, and the other came from an upper-class family, which explains how she managed to acquire a library of over 4,000 books, which makes my library light here look pretty pitiful by comparison. Either way, their experiences were not typical of women in Spanish colonial America. And I haven't even addressed the fact that within the caste system, one could be excused from their role in society a practice known as gracias al sucar. This allowed individuals to petition the king of Spain to be moved up to the peninsulare class. 
This was taken advantage of by merchants or other individuals who had the means to petition the king. Now, does this practice legitimize the social hierarchy, or does it prove its pointlessness? Regardless, colonial Spanish America had a legal, complex social hierarchy, but the stories of Arauzo and Yanez provide interesting examples to examine. They provide insight into how individuals could navigate these hierarchies, and provide possible lessons for those seeking to understand their own social positions or how to play different roles in their own societies. Well, they raise a lot of questions, too. I want to thank you for joining me on this bite of history. I hope you learned something, and I'll see you next time.